The university in exile where, again, they brought women over, brought, but, but, you know, brought professors over to, you know, to, to save them. Um, it, it just was, it, it was all of, of, of a, um, all of a piece of who gets educated, who is able to be at the table. And so groups that had been under, because it was only, you know, white men that got to be educated. Um, so, you know, who, who gets to sit at the table, really? In 1933, the New School's leadership reacted to Hitler's grab for power. European scholars were at risk. Many were dismissed from university positions because of their religious or political affiliations. President Alvin Johnson and others initially rescued 11 social scientists in the fall of 1933, bringing them to New York to form the University in Exile, which would become the graduate faculty. Eventually, 181 refugee scholars would come through the new school over the next 12 years. Among the initial 11 was one woman, economist, Frida Wunderlich. Her presence in that group of all men is, is notable. And she was not only a well-known economist and a well-known sociologist and something of a politician, I believe, a progressive politician back in her native Germany, but when she arrived in this country, she not only made her mark, but she became the first female dean of a graduate school here at the New School not only here at the New School, but the first female dean of a graduate school in all of the United States. Again, I think that's a historic moment that needs to be acknowledged and honored, and she's very little known for that. Born in 1984 in Berlin into a prosperous Jewish family, Frida attended a gymnasium for boys in Berlin because there was no rigorous training for girls. Frida then joined the first tiny cohort of women admitted to graduate study. She earned her PhD from the University of Freiburg in 1919. Frida focused her research, publication, and political activities on public scholarship, Republican governance, and the study of humane labor practices. She shaped her career in collaboration with other German feminists as part of the vigorous international women's movement. Frida is rescued, and she doesn't go on to be a splashy New York academic. She goes on to be a great teacher and an important force for social good. What, what more can you ask of anybody in their lifetime? These are women who are thinkers. These are women who are feminists in the most vital way because they enact what they believe. This is true of Frida. And as I've just been teaching with Ellen Freeberg, my great colleague, a course called Recovering Hannah Arendt, Arendt too struggles as a woman. We, we are taught, we are encouraged not to think of her in that way, but of course she's a woman. And of course she struggles with being a public thinker in a world that 
is never quite ready for one. Hannah Arendt is part of the canonical group of thinkers here at the New School. When I was in graduate school, the only female figure that I remember seeing in a syllabus, and you know, maybe there was a rigore, or maybe I had to go and find her work when I was interested in doing something on psychoanalysis and feminist theory. But the only person who was really taken seriously and taught uh, in full was Hannah Arendt. I think one of my professors had studied a bit with her. And certainly, she is uh, a formidable figure whose oeuvre is enormous and of significant importance. But um, to simply be teaching her and passing her on as part of your legacy, male or female, to the next generation of students is something we have to really reevaluate. A feminist education, uh, first of all, would be um, one that takes very seriously the legacy of women in the past and grapples with uh, the, their absence from the historical record in a way that's both honest and, and uh, helpful. Uh, a feminist education would also address the ways in which those wrongs are attempting, attempted to be righted at the moment. And a feminist education also would be open-minded in having conversations about these kinds of issues, whether about the presence of women on the syllabus, the presence of women as instructors, the presence of women in the class, and the presence of, of uh, non-binary identifying people throughout the university. Again, just opening up questions. The idea that the categories of the past, which have been predominantly male, are simply insufficient. And what do we do when those categories are insufficient? How do we address those problems? How do we create new questions? And how do we find new answers that don't replicate the limitations and the blindnesses of past answers. One year after Wunderlich's death in 1965, Arian Mack joined the graduate faculty for political and social science the permanent division of the school that began as the university in exile. As a research psychologist, Arian focused on the social field of visual perception. Once at the new school, she became the editor of Social Research, the journal founded at the graduate faculty in 1934. Hannah Arendt who, when she had heard that I was uh, offered the position, actually came to my office and said to me, to talk to me about being the editor of social research, urging me, despite all my qualms, because I didn't seem to think I had any uh, really uh, a background that would have led anyone to think I could be editor of social research, uh, urging me to take it and telling me that it would change my life and she was right it did change my life and I think for the better and I guess the one more comment the one other comment that came along with this package uh, which I say with a certain uh, diffidence I guess is that uh, the, Joe Greenbaum who was the Dean who as you know now and who offered me the editorship of the journal held a party and he, uh, it was in his house and it was a party to which all my colleagues at the graduate faculty were invited. And in the midst of this party he made a toast to me and the toast he made was, uh, said something like 
The reason I chose Arian to be editor is that she was the prettiest member of the graduate faculty. And to be, to, even now, when I think of that moment, I want it to fall through the floor. Today, Arian Mack continues to lead the journal Social Research. Building on the new school's vital legacy, she recently founded the New University in Exile Consortium, a dynamic center that continues the institution's original mission to support and protect endangered scholars around the globe. One of the things that sticks with me about Arian is the fact that she has both um, been obviously a very progressive um, female figure in her uh, efforts to gain an education when she did and to forge ahead as a researcher in psychology um, during the 60s, 70s, and beyond. Uh, but in addition to talking about the challenges that she faced when she first came here and she put those on tape for us, she also never stopped thinking about the importance of maintaining the legacy of the university in exile. Now, we want to do more than rest on our laurels thinking about that moment in 1933 or even thinking about the moments in 1919. We want to do more than rest on our laurels from 1933 where we had a president who had enough foresight to think about saving folks, academics from Europe and bringing them here. Um, but it's also important to still maintain elements of that and make them fresh for today. And Arian has never let go, even when she was the solo voice talking about the need to save endangered scholars. She has never let go of that project. Women have been drawn to the New School because it's a very dynamic, exciting place. And interestingly, as we begin to recover the names of women, some women who came here just for panel discussion or a performance, we discover that they keep on coming. And I think that's because in the ethos of the university, there is this hint of receptivity to feminism. That I think, I like to think of that as the abiding spirit of the founding mothers. <laughs>